We are so happy you're with us to start off the week here at CNN Student News. I'm Christina Park. First up, arguing the issues, Democratic presidential candidates go in front of the camera to debate each other in the race for the White House. Breaking up the plot, officials say three men are in custody for planning to attack the fuel supply of one of America's busiest airports. And bringing down the house after 20 years, the former home of the NBA's Hornets says goodbye in a cloud of dust. First up today, the 2008 presidential election shines a spotlight on New Hampshire. The northeastern state is getting a lot of camera time this week as it hosts two debates for White House hopefuls. Yesterday, the Democratic candidates squared off in front of the cameras. The eight contenders took to the stage hoping to stand out from the crowd and convince the audiences there and watching on TV that they should get their party's nomination for president. The war in Iraq was one of the biggest topics they debated. But they also spent time talking about where they stand on the issues of immigration, education, and health care. And that's just one of the times presidential candidates will be arguing the issues in front of the TV cameras. These debates, they're a really big part of American politics, but they haven't been around for that long. Gary Nuremberg looks at the history of televised debates. You say that, that we'll now have questions, gentlemen, then we move over here, right? Right. Good. Excellent. Right. Oh, and incidentally... Getting ready for the first televised presidential debate, Nixon-Kennedy in 1960, director Don Hewitt had a problem. I think I better shave. He looked like death warmed over, and he wouldn't wear makeup. Nixon's appearance was a factor that night. The demands of television sharing the stage with issue positions as candidates sought to make an impression on millions of voters at one time. Debates have hurt candidates. There is no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe. The remark damaged the Ford campaign in 1976. There's differences. <sighs> Al Gore's size and facial expressions were viewed as a negative in 2000. Presidential debaters remember the lesson. From their point of view, it's about not screwing up, about making no big mistakes. But it may be worth the risk, especially before the field has narrowed. A very good performance uh, by somebody attracts attention from both donors and voters. There's Memorable one-liners can mean a good performance. Ronald Reagan disparaging Jimmy Carter in 1980. There you go again. Walter Mondale assessing Gary Hart's policies in 1984. Where's the beef? Critics ask, where's the beef? in the debates. It's silly to try to deal with issues like what's your answer on health care and you have 30 seconds. I mean, you can't do it. And Hewitt says get rid of what he calls the news guys who are trying to look nonpartisan. Well, if you're not partisan, you shouldn't be in a debate. Debates are about partisan. They're not about news conferences. Gingrich proposes a series of 90-minute discussions between the two major party candidates concentrating on issues they choose, no reporters, just before the 2008 election, a contemporary version of the 19th century Lincoln-Douglas debates where candidates can answer in depth the key question. Who am I? <laughs> Why am I here? <laughs> Gary Nuremberg, CNN, Washington. The Democrats debated yesterday and tomorrow, the Republican candidates step up to the podium. So get geared up with our debate viewing guide, learn about the issues, follow along with the action, and pick out the winner. Check it all out at CNN.com education. We asked for your thoughts in the top headlines of the academic year, and many of you answered the Virginia Tech shootings. On April 16, 2007, a gunman killed 32 people on campus before taking his own life. Teacher Jerry Prescott from Yakima, Washington, wrote that two of his students suggested the horrific killings on the Virginia Tech campus should be one of the major news stories for the year. Out of that tragedy came tributes. Church services, memorial services, moments of silence, all of these were held throughout the country. The school offered students full credit if they wanted to quit for the year, but some wouldn't think of it. The school is such a part of me that I could never imagine leaving. Thousands attended Virginia Tech's commencement ceremony in May, where there was a bittersweet mix of tears, memories, applause, and, as in so many other graduations, the determination to succeed. With your CNN Student News Video Yearbook, I'm Carl Azuz. A thousand flights go through John F. Kennedy Airport in New York every day, and the fuel for all those flights mainly comes from the Buckeye Pipeline. Well, it's safe today, thanks to law enforcement officials who say they've broken up a plan to attack the pipeline and the busy airport's fuel supply. John Lawrence has more on this alleged plot. 
Four men, three in custody and one still being sought, have been charged with plotting a terror attack against fuel vehicles and pipelines at New York's JFK airport. The devastation that would be caused had this plot succeeded is just unthinkable. Investigators say the plot didn't get beyond the planning stages. Officials say the men had revealed their plans to known Muslim extremists and were worried by the tenacity of their efforts. One clear signature of this cell was its persistence. They consistently worked to refine their plot. Officials say one of the suspects, Russell DeFreitas, is a former airport employee. Another suspect, Abdul Qadir, is reportedly a former member of parliament from that same South American nation. You have a former employee at JFK Airport who comes together with a former high-ranking official in Guyana who has the contacts, who can bring this plot to those who can provide the operational support, the means, the methods. An FBI source says the plot was revealed when the suspects attempted to recruit a law enforcement informant. I'm John Lawrence, reporting from Atlanta. Time for the shout out. This is the flag of what European country? Is it Malta, Italy, France, or Germany? You've got three seconds, go. Today's answer, Germany. The current flag has flown over the entire country since it was reunified in 1990. Germany's getting ready to host a gathering of world leaders at the annual G8 convention. It's a group of eight countries that meets every year to talk about major world issues. A couple of items on this year's agenda, global warming and the war in Iraq. President Bush will attend the meeting and Suzanne Malveau has more on his trip. President Bush is heading to Europe, trying to convince the world of one thing. We are a compassionate nation. That message may be a tough sell for Mr. Bush, who faces criticism for the chaos in Iraq, growing tension with Russia, and widespread skepticism about his approach to tackling global warming. In a transparent effort to blunt some of that criticism, President Bush spent the week ahead of the G8 summit laying out a series of global initiatives including a speech proposing long-term goals to limit greenhouse gas emissions among the world's 15 biggest polluters. The United States takes this issue seriously. Germany's leader, Angela Merkel, host of the G8, welcomed his remarks, but wants a binding agreement to cut greenhouse gases in half by 2050. There is no sign the U.S. will sign up for that. The climate change issue is sure to test the still developing relationship between Mr. Bush and Merkel, who last year got acquainted by sharing a German barbecue and back rub. This year's class photo will look different for President Bush with new leaders from France, Japan, and soon Britain. You have a leadership in Europe that is more pro-American. But it is far from certain whether that means Mr. Bush will get his way on key issues, such as imposing tougher sanctions on Iran and Sudan expanding free trade and building a proposed U.S. NATO missile defense shield in Eastern Europe. That plan is vehemently opposed by Russian President Vladimir Putin, who sees it as a potential threat and a source of friction between the U.S. and Russia. Russia is playing a very tough game in Europe and is trying to divide the Europeans among themselves and the Europeans from the United States. President Bush will try to reassert his position as a player on the world stage at the G8 summit, but he's not taking anything for granted. He's already set up a personal meeting with Putin at his family's Kenny Bunkport home to try to further strengthen ties. Suzanne Malvo, CNN, the White House. Before we go, taking down a hornet's hive, the Charlotte Coliseum has been around for almost 20 years, but it took less than 15 seconds and 550 pounds of explosives to turn it into a pile of dust. The building was nicknamed The Hive because it was home to the NBA's Hornets. But the team left town a few years ago, and yesterday it was time for The Hive to say goodbye. And now it's our time to say goodbye, at least for today. But we'll see you back again tomorrow for more CNN Student News. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Christina Park.